as we embark on another Easter this year, uh, and as we've even discussed here uh, privately, prematurely, uh, even if you will, I didn't mean to put you on the spot with any of that, Karen, I hope I didn't, uh, that uh, we are all dealing with things uh, in our lives. We all have situations and circumstances that we are facing. Uh, some of them will create all kinds of emotion, fear, anxiety, uh, anger, uh, laughter, happiness. I mean, we can run the whole gamut of emotions. Tomorrow, uh, I do a funeral for a young man that grew up just a, a, a couple houses, uh, a couple blocks actually, uh, away from me my whole life. I've known him my whole life. His name is uh, Eric Southern. And uh, my, it's kind of crazy, my sister actually hit him on a bicycle. She was coming down uh, O Street uh, on his 10 speed and she had an old brown Buick. And she was going up 15th and he never stopped for the stop sign or nothing. I watched him as he launched over the hood of her car. And uh, my sister Rhonda, she was hysterical because she thought she had just killed this kid, you know, but he bounced up off the ground. And, pedaled away frantically uh, but he passed uh, this week much too young, much too early uh, and so I have to do that funeral tomorrow and one of the unfortunate things that we have to do uh, when we're called into the ministry is that we have to deal with a lot of dire situations that involve death uh, we've done funerals this year for way too many young people uh, who have succumbed to overdoses uh, and suicide. Way too many. Way, now one is way too many of even. Uh, but I have done lots. Uh, I, I say this year. I've done lots already this year. Far too many already this year. Uh, more than need to be. And so a lot of times uh, I think about uh, death differently than I used to. It's only by the grace of God that I'm able to do that. Uh, I had a dream last night, and every now and then I have these real vivid, uh, I mean lifelike dreams. And more often than not, whenever I have these real vivid lifelike dreams, they involve my father, who passed away uh, when I was 19 years old. Uh, because of the results of alcoholism and cancer and uh, you name it, he was just, he had destroyed his body through uh, years of hard living. And it's kind of weird, and yet it's kind of comforting at the same time, uh, because in those dreams, I'm never scared of him, because he was my best friend. Never intimidated by him, or afraid of him, because he was my dad. And so it's almost like it's an opportunity that I get to revisit with him for whatever that brief moment is in that time, that dream. Last night was the first time in any of those real vivid, and you can ask my wife, I woke up crying before. They're so real. They're so vivid. And I just don't have those kinds of dreams. Uh, normally my dreams are short and stupid stuff, you know, but these are always real vivid. They're real intricate. And, uh, the one last night was the first time ever uh, that I woke up not crying and absolutely comforted because it was the first time in any of those dreams that I've had over the years, and they've been few and far between, uh, that I ever got to tell my dad bye. Finally made it to the completion of a dream, uh, and I got to tell him bye as I was leaving what was the old house that we used to live in. It was crazy. But... Because of a young man, because I lost my father so young, and because as a young man, uh, children didn't have playrooms in funeral homes and those kinds of things. And as, as a young child, I experienced a lot of death with uh, my grandmother, my grandfather on my dad's side, my grandfather on my mom's side, passed away uh, when I was just in middle school. Uh, lots and lots of people that I have loved have went on uh, in this life, past this life, in death, uh, 
people who have been very near and dear to me. I want to say this, my brother's here tonight, and I don't want him to be upset, uh, but as a 13-year-old boy, one of the experiences that I had, uh, we had a guy, they called him the Undertaker, <laughs> because that's what he did. He lived just across our backyard, and he and my dad were great friends, and they did all kinds of silly stuff together. But inevitably, whenever we would go to the funeral home, uh, I would always have to see him. And so my brother lost a child in its infancy. And I never will forget that they said, well, we don't need pallbearers, we just need a pallbearer. And they asked me if I would do that. And so you muster up the strength and you puff your chest out at 13 years old and you say, I'm man enough that I can do that. I won't cry. Uh, I'll be strong and I'll do it for my brother and for my family who I love very much. And the casket was so small that they never placed it in the back of the car. Ronnie Wagner, the undertaker, he sat me in the front seat of the hearse. And I remember this so vividly, because you can imagine as a 13 year old, kids don't experience stuff like this, at least not often. And they laid that beautiful little white casket on my lap. And I helped my brother's little baby grow. As we drove to the cemetery, to lay her to rest. And so I've not been very respondent to death. I don't like it. I don't like it. Because I've experienced the pain and the heartache that it creates. Not only for me, but for so many. I was brought up in a home and I was taught my whole life that big boys don't cry. And so I was never allowed to do this. You had to suck it up, buttercup. You dried those eyes up and you put that weeping away. That was for women. Men didn't do that. But back in February of 1997, when I gave my heart and my life to Christ, there was something that happened for the very first time that I ever remembered in my life as a young adult. I felt water run out of my eyes and down my face. I felt all the pain and all the hurt that had ever been created in my life get turned upside down. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. <sighs> and it just started running out of me and running out of me and running out of me to the point where my own wife makes fun of me now because we'll sit in bed, there'll be a television commercial that'll come on. It'll make me weep, man. It can be stupid stuff, too. I mean, if it's just a little bit cheesy, <laughs> I mean, uh, it'll light me up. I'll start crying. I watched a video yesterday. I wish I would have had it prepared. I would have showed it to you tonight. But it was a young boy that lost his father in infancy and then lost his mother just a few months prior to him. So he didn't know what to do with his life. He was living with his aunt. He had tried to wake his mom up in her death. He said, I tried. And I tried. He had a real southern accent. Cute little boy. Yeah. You can find it on my timeline on Facebook. He said, I tried to wake her up. I tried to wake her up. He said, but she just wouldn't get up. And this little boy took it upon himself to recognize and realize that death hurts. It stings. There's pain involved with it. And so he had experienced that hurt not once but twice. And how old was he? Other four or five? Five, five year old. And so he asked his aunt if they could go downtown in the city where they lived at. And he took little plastic rubber duckies. Little plastic dinosaurs because he said those make people happy. And he began to distribute and hand those out to people that he saw just at random. If they looked like they were having a bad day, if they looked like they were sad, if they looked like they were upset, he would take them a rubber ducky or a dinosaur. And the guy that was interviewing him was just absolutely amazed at how many smiles he had put on so many faces. And so the reporter asked him, he said, you know, what 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 kind of what is your goal with all this? How many smiles do you want to deliver through this process that you have created? He said 33,000. <laughs> it was so specific, 33,000 smiles. Uh, and of course the reporter said, I think you've already done that. Uh, but of course my immediate thought, because I thought so much of that, I thought, I want to go to Oriental Trading Company 
that junk Chinese company that sells all those junk toys that all your kids want on the 4th of July and every holiday and every parade wrap. And I want to buy him 33,000 or 15,150, if you will, dinosaurs, 15,150 rubber duckies. Yeah. Just so he can give away 33,000 of them. All right. And 33,000 smiles that come with it. Because I realize that at five years old, He's got the time in his life left to do that. Easily. But when I look at the frailty of life, and I look uh, how exceedingly I think about the guy that I'm preaching the funeral for tomorrow that's only a couple of years older than I am. I think about my own self being lifeline to Indianapolis and death knocking at my door and how quickly it comes. And how it can turn your life upside down just that quickly. I was reminded I'm getting older. But I'm thankful. I'm thankful today that I don't have to fear death. It's been one of the most comforting aspects of being a Christian because I have to tell you this. I wasn't afraid to die as a young man. I did lots of stupid things that could have took my life. But even though I wasn't afraid to die, there was something deep down in me that was fearful of what came after death. I think ultimately it opened my heart up that much more when it came time to accept Christ Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And it was liberating finally to find out that I had had a way to be free from death. Not to free the people that would be left behind from the hurt that it would create, if it does. But to know that I would have an eternity in my father's house. And so Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, and I'm not there yet, Heather, I'll get to you when I get to the scriptures, I want you to pull up. But in 11.25 of the book of John, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That's encouraging, folks. Because I don't care how tough you are, there is finality in death. There's finality in it. I rode in too many hearses to too many gravesides. I've watched people do some of the silliest things that I've ever seen at funerals. I've watched them rattle the casket around, unzip biker jackets to shove joints in it, and grams of meth and stuff. And I've wondered to myself sometimes, because I've been, uh, I've been estranged and jonesing, if you will, wanting that high. And I've wondered to myself, I wonder how long it took before they went and dug up that body to get their dope back. Because the reality is they surely knew that they weren't going to use that. Because you don't do no meth when you're dead. You don't do no heroin when you're gone. No. You can actually achieve no other high than except you know Christ Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Yep. And make heaven your home for eternity. Yep. Everything beyond that is a buzzkill. It's a bummer. It's an eternity in a devil's hell. And so church, tonight, it's important that as Karen said, we don't begin to classify people and look at people and think of them as less than we are, maybe because they don't have the clothes as nice as we have, or drive a car as nice as ours, or live in a house as big as ours, or have the money that we have. And unfortunately, we live in a society today where that is all too common. It is characteristic in the world that we live in. And that's why I'm so thankful that I get a pastor Momentum Community Church, where our motto is to love people right where they're at. And one of the, one of the greatest compliments I receive as a pastor week in and week out is to hear somebody say they love this church when they visit it. They love the people. They love feeling welcomed. 
They love that they can come in whatever attire they have. They love the fact that nobody's going to look down on them, snub their nose at them, talk about them, or even run them out the door like they have been in so many other churches. Right. Folks, let me tell you something. It's important that we remain that way. Yeah. Because our objective isn't to fill the pews. And too many churches have got it twisted. That's right. Don't get me wrong. It's fun. That's a good quality to have. When you can pack them full, that's more people that you can spread the gospel to. We'll be packed full here Easter Sunday. I'm looking forward to it. There'll be facials that we'll see Sunday morning of Easter that we haven't seen since last Easter. <laughs> and so my objective in that time that I'm given on Easter Sunday is to rescue every soul I can from the damnation of a devil's hell. Yeah. It's not to tickle your ears and fancy you with stories that you've heard in churches all your life every Easter Sunday. My sole initiative on Easter Sunday is to reach every lost person in this church with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because I know to be void of it is to die lost. And I watch people die every day as a minister. But I'm not afraid of death. And those that have the security of Christ Jesus in their heart and their life, they may still fumble around back and forth with it. But you stay in the Word of God. You stay prayed up and you stay in the house of God. And inevitably, that fear will cease to exist. You'll find yourself strong enough and insurmountable enough that you'll look at the devil and say, flee from me, Satan. You have no part or no parcel in this life. I have the promise that God has given me an eternity in heaven. In my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. That's the word of God. We read about it as you guys study on Sunday mornings in the book of Revelation. You study uh, one of the things that you're going to study, you're going to, you're going to hear a lot about heaven. Walls of jewels and jasper and street of gold. I laughed one time because I thought to myself, I wonder why the word of God only refers to a street of gold and not streets of gold. And then I remembered, oh yeah, men are going to be there. Now you women should laugh at that because you know if you've ever been in an automobile with any one of us men, one of the most stubborn attributes we have is to ever admit that we are lost. We take a wrong turn. I know where I'm at. <laughs> Heather, she's back there, amen, and I'm nodding her head. She's about to flip her bone out of her hair. Because I'm horrible about it. So now I've got to figure it out. God said you can go down and back. That's it. <laughs> I don't know how long that street of gold is, but God made it so that all I had to do was travel to one end and say hi to everybody on one side of the street and say hi to everybody on the other side of the street on my way back. Anything more than that, I find myself lost somewhere in heaven. And God can't allow that to happen. So in 2017, Inc. Magazine published a research uh, article on what Americans fear the most. And number one on the list, now listen to this in the time that we're in right now, in 2017, number one uh, on Inc. Magazine's research of what Americans fear was corrupt government officials. That's what they fear more than anything. Do you know where death fell? It barely made the top 50, number 48. And there's a reason why. There's a reason why. I, I believe I know the reason why because I believe uh, the problem with annual surveys is that they tend to reflect what people fear most at the moment. Yeah. Uh, rather than what they fear uh, in the grand scheme of things, yeah. if you will. So, in 2000, when we were about to embark into uh, a, a new century, remember uh, Y2K? People had bunkered down, had filled their food shelters, had dug holes in the ground. There was going to be this great 
uh, 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 triage of disaster. Power and infrastructure was going to go out. The World Wide Web wasn't even the World Wide Web then. And we were worried about it crashing and causing an economic crash. And what would, what would happen if it just crashed today? Oh, yeah. We're more linked in than we ever were. People were absolutely consumed with Y2K. The closer it got, the more anxious and the more anxiety and the more paranoia that was filled around that day. And I'm going to tell you something, man. Just from my perspective as a young Christian at that point, I didn't care. Because I knew that to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. And I'd even heard people refer to it as maybe that that was going to be when the rapture was going to take place. But I kind of knew in my heart of hearts that it wasn't going to work out that way because God said man would not know the day and the time that he would return. And how could we possibly schedule it down to January 1st of 2000. Yeah. But I also know this, that people tend to fear uh, what they have the most knowledge of or the most experience with as well. So when we are working around heavy equipment, or we're in the aggregate industry and you are walking with me next to a conveyor that is slinging rock 150 mile an hour, I'm probably going to have you pretty close to me if you've never been there before. I'm going to have you within arm's reach because I know that any piece of that equipment out there, especially if it's my kids, any piece of that equipment out there does not care about you. It don't know your name. It don't know your address. It don't know who your spouse is or how many kids you have and it certainly does not care whether you go home or not. And people around here that work in the limestone industry for years and years live the same way. My dad, when he worked for architectural stone cells, he had a big stick that laid on top of his machine. He was a, a head hooker for years and he would warn those guys to stay out from underneath that rock. It weighs more than 10 automobiles. It'll squish you flat on a pancake. One of those young guys would come through the mill and haphazardly walk underneath that rock. And my dad would be waiting for him on the other side of it. And on that big white stick he had painted in red fingernail polish or something. I don't know where he got it at. It said head getter. And that's what it was for. He would slap those new guys right in the head with a bang. And he would oftentimes tell them, hey, if you're stupid enough to want to die, I'd like to be the one to kill you. So why don't you just let me do it rather than that rock? Because at least I'll remember your name. That rock won't. I'll come to your graveside. That rock won't. Because death isn't considered a clear and present danger to most people. It's out of sight. It's out of mind. I think that the one thing that we have to understand, though, part of the gospel message that we have to display and we have to get through to people is that death is coming for all of us. I mean, except those Christians who are alive uh, at the rapture of the church. Other than that, nobody is exempt from death. It's often been laughed and joked about that there are two things that you can guarantee in life, and that is death and taxes. I can certainly say that I've lived long enough that I probably agree with both of those. I definitely agree with both of those. Yeah. Because I've not lived a year of my life yet where death hasn't been imminent and taxes have not been paid. And so we look into the book of Hebrews, Heather, in the second chapter, verse 14, and it says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And so can I tell you with all the certainty that I have in me tonight, I know this, that any time that you are fearful of death, that that is Satan toying with you. Because it's his avenue. He knows about it. He runs the show in that environment. I remember many times visiting hospitals and those that had the peace 
of God residing in their heart. As I would come in as a minister to stand by their bedside and I would take their hand and their family would be there. I could look at almost every one of them and I could tell them this. I could say, hey, uh, I remember doing it even with my grandmother the day after my birthday. As I held her hand, I said, Grandma, everybody that loves you is right here in this room with you. It's okay. You have suffering over. You can go now. Breathe her last breath in comfort. And left this world for the heavenly one that I know that she's in. <laughs> I can also tell you about the times that I would stand by the bedside of a man. And I would hold his hand. And I'd say, have you asked Jesus into your heart and into your life? And he'd say, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late, Reno. My feet are on fire. I can feel the heat. My feet are on fire. He was screaming in the intensive care room. Luckily, I had one of my mentors, Mike Hosapple, was with me that night. Mike Hosapple stepped in where I didn't know what to say at that point. He said, let me tell you something, young man. He said, you still have breath in your lungs. He said, if you can talk while you're in this hospital bed, it's not too late. Do you want to ask Jesus into your heart and into your life? You need to be born again! Or those flames are going to become the reality of what you feel. And he said, I do. And I and my clothes apple led him in a sinner's prayer that night. And at the conclusion of that prayer, I saw the peace that passeth all understanding flood over his body. As the angels of God, I feel, were ministering over him and allowed him to relax. And no longer he felt the fire. Folks, that's too close. That's too close. That's too close. We sing about knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. But it's too close. We are knocking on hills. And we have not made heaven our home. Yeah. We live in a society and a world today where that is still the reality of the world that we live in. People are dying lost every day. At the click of two seconds as a globe. 1,001, 1,002. There they go. 1,001, 1,002. There's another 1,001, 1,002. There's another 1,001, 1,002. There's another 1,001, 1,002. There's another 1,001, 1,002. There's another. Let that sink in. That's how quickly we are grappling with death every day. And I don't say that to make you fearful of death. I say it. So that you, as I, can see the urgency in it. Now, we don't have any more time to play any more games. If we're ever going to press under the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus, now's the time. We've got to get with it, church. We've got to tell people about Christ Jesus. Don't ever allow fear to overcome you and allow your lips to be silent. Because in telling somebody about Jesus, you may be saving them from a devil's hell and an eternal death. In the 15th verse of that second chapter of Hebrews, it says this. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's what death can create in us. It can become the shackles and the chains that limit us from living the most glorious life that God has prepared for us. Doesn't mean that you have to live stupidly because you're a Christian. Go out and just tease death and then bite it. It's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that death can become, or the fear of death, not death itself, but the fear of death can become so overwhelming that we can become in bondage to it throughout all the days of our life. That's why it's important to teach your children not to be afraid of cemeteries and graveyards and funeral homes. My mom always told me growing up, she said, son, it's not the dead that you have to worry about, it's the ones that are alive. I found that I have progressed in age. That is so much the truth. Yeah. 
We used to play no ghost in the graveyard over there at Green Hill Cemetery. And we would enjoy those times of running through the graveyard and screaming, Ah! When it was dark and thinking that somebody was going to reach out and get a hold of us. Only to find out the only person that ever stepped out from behind one of those creepy tombstones or even climbed out of some of those vaults and stuff that were over there were just our cousins. Something creepy about this. It's not something that we need to be fearful of, and it's certainly not something that we need to be in bondage to. And so let me take you to 1 Corinthians. I want to get us out of here. In chapter 15, uh, verse 54. Do I have 54? Yeah. Uh, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Remember how many times I've shared with you that on the cross when Jesus fell under the weight of death and he gave up the ghost, it says, and he breathed his last, his body literally would have collapsed under the weight of death. His arms would ever be presented for us in a sign of victory. He didn't stay stretched like this upon the cross. That's fictional. Yeah. Those are Catholic symbolisms that have been placed in your mind and in your eyes because you've seen the statues. You've seen the painted pictures. But the reality is, is that once his side was pierced and he gushed out and breathed his life, his body fell and collapsed. His arms would take this V that we see so many athletes take as a symbol of victory. It should be symbolic to us as we read through this scripture that death is swallowed up in victory. The victory of Jesus Christ. The victory that after he died on that cross, he was placed in a tomb. And a lot can change in three days. And as the devil and all the minions of hell began to party, and riot through the earth because of the victory they thought that they had received because Jesus had stumbled into death only to find out that when the stone was rolled away Jesus had risen in true victory over death hell and the grave yeah now think about that why was it pertinent for God to place in his word death and the grave. Death, hell, and the grave. You remember reading the scripture, right? Where Jesus comes out, they say, with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And it's a little twisted scripture there. You really need to research that uh, and really look into that because it's not exactly... Well, it says, but I think that the pertinence in that and the importance in that is that when we just read that scripture where it said that it can become an insurmountable object for us in life. We can worry about it to the point that we can become of no avail in the world that we live in. We can become of no good use for the kingdom of heaven because we would be forever fearful of a thing called death. But God said, you don't have to worry about death. You don't even have to worry about the grave. And in every graveyard that I preach in, every head of every casket, unless they have misplaced them somehow, some way, or into some whacked out graveyard that I have never been in yet, they always lay the deceased in a coffin where their head faces the eastern sky. Why? Because it's biblical. Even if you're an atheist, you're going to be laid facing the eastern sky. Yeah. Because one day the Bible says... That the trump will resound and that sky's going to bust open and God's going to come back gloriously. Whew. Yeah. And all those that are dead in Christ and are in the grave. Whew, yeah. Will be come taken on. out of this. Yeah, come on. Woo! Ain't no grave going to hold me down. Yeah. I've made it our tithing song at the end of every video that we've ever made here at Momentum Community Church, I think. Because I love that song. Because I recognize and realize that I have victory over death, but there ain't no grave ever going to hold me down. Yeah, come on. I'm coming up out of the ground. Yeah. And so in verse 55, 
It says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And Heather, you should give me a little altar call music tonight, honey. Let me share this, and we won't even go into, I'll read the rest of that scripture, but it'll be really quick. I was reminded of a story of a young man who was allergic to bees. And he was riding in the back seat, like kids often did back in the day. Used to, you didn't have to be buckled into a car seat or anything. This young man, as he was standing probably in the back of an old vehicle, bouncing down the road, gravel road, a bee flew in. And he was highly allergic to bees, to the point where one sting, he had been told, could kill you. This is back before EpiPens and all those things that are life-saving devices that people... Oh, say, help me. Help me, Lord. Stay on track here. People are being way overcharged for uh, since our new president came into office. <sighs> Stay on track. Stay on track. And so as the bee flies in the window, heaven, you can imagine this with one of your little boys. He began to scream absolutely freak out because doctors had told him if you get stung by a bee there's good probability that you'll never make it to a hospital in time your son will probably die and in the midst of those conversations the boy had heard that and so he begins to scream and run frantically back and forth over the seat until finally his father reaches out into the air and says son Relax. Relax. And as his boy began to calm and as his heart rate began to go down, his father opened up his hand and the bee flew out of his palm. And as the bee flew out of his palm, the boys began to become frantic again. And he said, Son, listen to me. You don't have to worry about that bee anymore. You see, his stinger is here in the palm of my hand. He can't hurt you anymore. Dad has accepted the sting of death. That is exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. This is an Easter message you get for free on Wednesday night. Jesus took the nails of Calvary's cross into his flesh so that he might remove the sting of death from the life of you and I. Yeah. So that we can walk with our head up and encouraged to know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. But ain't no grave going to hold me down. And so it's never been more pertinent than it is today, folks, that we remind people that they don't have to fear death. At least not if they know Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if they don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, take every opportunity that has been given to you to tell them about the love of Jesus. Don't leave it in the hands of your pastor. Don't leave it in the hands of an evangelist. Don't pray that they get a gospel tract delivered to them or pray that they get a gospel tract delivered to them and that you're the one that gets to deliver it. Yeah. But never be ashamed to tell people about Jesus because many today are fearful by a thing called death. People can talk tough all they want, but when you've seen death a few times, you know that the grave is finality. And yet Jesus had victory over it, arose from it, and walked amongst the people that they might give witness to that victory that he received. Guys, pray. Pray that God puts someone in your path that you can tell them about Jesus. Read your Bibles. Pray. Don't forget.
forget about your church. It's not this church. Let me help you find a good one where they'll teach you about the Word of God. They'll pray for you. As important as everything that Karen said tonight, they'll love you. Yeah. And they'll accept you for who you are. Amen? Amen. The Word of God goes on in verse 57. It says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, unmovable. Listen to this. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know what that means? Heaven? That means that we're supposed to abound. Skip into it. Woohoo! I'm going to go tell people about Jesus. It's not a gruesome thing for me. It's not a sad thing for me. Happy day! I got life in my letters. I got air to breathe. I can tell somebody about the King of Kings. Woo! Let's take on today with the fresh breath of air in our lungs and the love of Jesus in our heart. Let's tell people about him. Amen? Amen. Abounding in the word of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Never. Woo! Amen. Palm Sunday this Sunday. We're going to have the kids involved in the service. But as important as it is to have the kids involved in the service with the Sunday, it's more important that we keep telling them about Jesus. We keep teaching them those godly things. We keep bringing them up in the way that they should go that when they grow older, they'll not turn away from it. Because if not, somebody, some evil person, some plague, he'll promote death on them. Or she will. Yeah. You may not believe it, but the devil already has somebody out there prepared to give those two little girls their first high. Not on my watch. Not on my watch, Jason. Ain't no way. Oh boy, take a beat down in the name of Jesus. Or oh girl, whatever. We gotta stand up. We gotta abound in the work of the Lord. As we approach Easter Sunday, I want you to tell everybody you can. If we get a big enough crowd before Easter Sunday gets here, we'll hope two services, three, four, I don't care. I'll preach until I fall over from the pulpit. That's how badly I want to win people to the cause of Christ Jesus. I pray that you do too. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the time tonight. Father, I pray that I haven't said anything outside of what has been led of the Spirit tonight. And I pray that we'll go forth and we'll abound in the work of Christ Jesus. That we'll invite, we'll invite, we'll invite, we'll encourage, we'll encourage, we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll tell, we'll tell people about you and your merciful love and your gracious grace. God, forgive us of our sins and our trespasses, the mistakes that we've made. Forgive us when we have failed to take that opportunity to tell somebody about you. Father, I pray as I think about it right now, will you help me in the funeral that I'm going to do tomorrow? I don't have the words to say. Father, I don't want to just shove the Bible down people's throats. So I need your help. We all need your help, Lord. Show us how to present the gospel better in the way that we live, the things that we say, and the things that we do. Help us and encourage us in the ways that only you can. And for your goodness and for your grace, May we today and every day give you praise and thanks in the name of your Son who gave us the victory on the cross. In the name of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for a great service tonight. Good morning.